Hello, I'm William Collins and I'm here with Anna Reagan. Now, Anne is um, a trustee and the vice chair of the Welsh charity FNF Both Parents Matter Cymru. The main uh, activity of that charity is to support non-resident parents, particularly in issues about children and contact. But the charity also provides a specialist service to male victims of domestic abuse. That's not the only charity that Anne is involved with and perhaps she'll tell us a little bit about the other ones as well. But as far as this interview is concerned, the most important thing is that Anne is a passionate advocate for men and boys here in South Wales particularly. So, Anne, thank you for sparing us some time this morning. Perhaps I can start off with a political question, because many people that uh, do advocate for men and boys get accused of being a far-right winger. Are you a far-right winger, Anne? That's a very interesting question, uh, William, because um, I'm a member of the Labour Party. I've been a member of the Labour Party for a long time but I can understand where you're coming from. Um, I've been a delegate in many a feminist organised um, conference and being the only one that, that um, would stand up um, and talk about men and boys issues, uh, I've been called a few things, um, but brave being one of them. Um, <laughs> but um, um, I've never heard, heard them call me far right as yet. Um, my husband reckons my politics may be um, centre-left. Very good. Now, let's get down to the charity, BPM Cymru, as we call it for short. Can you tell me what... Um, well, let's start off with the, the service users, shall we? What, what are the service users typically of that, of that charity? Typically men. Um, Typically, um, fathers, married fathers, um, we get some grandmothers, we get some mothers, but um, it's, it's mostly men um, that, that come to our charity. And what do you, what do you personally do? Uh, what, you, what is your role in the charity and what is the charity's role as a whole in terms of supporting those men? Well, my role, I'm an emotional support volunteer or as a, as a buddy as we call it now. Um, I've been that for quite some time. Um, I've sort of helped to facilitate um, the solicitor when they, they want to see the solicitor. Um, but the emotional support side of it is, is they, you know, when they come in, I meet and greet, register them, and once then we've got a few minutes, I, I try and talk to them, try and give them confidence to share their story if they can. Um, sometimes they're, they're in such a state they can't even attend the full meeting, uh, that they need to stay outside that. Um, so it's, um, yeah, we, we, get them, we get them service users that are angry, that are emotionally wrecked, that are, are just so, so very sad and very desperate. What, what's causing this uh, reaction in these men? Well, uh, I think that the system is failing, the, the system is failing badly. I mean, they, they first, uh, w when they separate, um, I, I think it comes a, as a, a complete shock to them that they, are, they can be denied contact with the children that they love. Uh, it's, they, they, they try, so many things. They they ask. They try mediation, and, and mediation is often refused by the other partner. And they try family members. Um, they 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 come to us usually when they've exhausted all other avenues, and which is sad because it 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 would be it would be good really to get them a lot earlier, so we can make them more resilient and and. Uh, and, and I think the, the professionals, uh, once Kafka's social workers get involved, it's, it, it's really, really disturbing on how they... I, I'm initially, I thought like Kafka's were there to sort of um, 
fact find and make sure that, that the children are safe. Um, but the meetings that I've sat in on uh, are, don't come over like that at all. So for, for the sake of viewers that aren't immersed in these issues, um, CAFCAS, what, what, what's it's that? Children and Family Court Advisory Service, Services. So it's, um, they initially, once they make an application to Family Court, they will contact both parents. Uh, it's usually the resident parent that they go to first. So they come to an interview the non-resident parent with preconceived ideas, I, mm. I, I, from my opinion, and I've sat in on a few. Um, so it's, it's not a good start for the non-resident parent. Mm. So um, we'll come back to the sort of services, but um, in terms of the operation of BPM Cymru, what services and support are offered by the charity to these men? Well, the, uh, we offer an awful lot of support. We've got, we've got a drop-in service for male victims of domestic abuse. That's, that's one of them. Uh, we can make applications for legal aid if they, if they fit the category. Um, we emotionally support them. We, um, we monitor their, their well-being and they, they're given a, a contact that they can, they, they, they can ring and we can check on them. That's um, what you meant by the, the buddy scheme. Yeah, the buddy, the, the buddy yeah, scheme, yeah. yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it used to be called just emotional support and now mm. we, we call it, you know, the buddy scheme. Um, and, you know, so many of these men are self-harming. I'd, I'd say that they're in such a state, they're so desperate to see their children. They, they, are, they are threatening, they're threatening themselves. It's, um, it's, it's awful. It's, um, how, how important would you say the emotional support element is? And, uh, and, and what sort of state are they in? Terrible state. I mean, we've, we've seen, I, re I remember one of the meetings where there was a, uh, a, a soldier came in with his mother. His mother was small. He was about six foot six, very, very well. And he was sobbing. His mother was holding. He was absolutely sobbing. Mm. I mean, it was um, just trying, I had to move him away from, from, from the, the, the group. I, I had to get... Um, a regional manager to go go in initially it, it and we see people like that we've seen mm. people in all emotional states and some very very angry with they, they just cannot believe how the the system is set against them having contact with it with their own children that they love very much and how does that how does that process work how is the system set against them it's uh, well, I, I, as I said, I think, you know, from the initial, from that first meeting, I just, with, with CAFCAS, I just wish I could sit in on every one of them um, because uh, our, the service users are very, very emotional. They offer far too much, you know, far too much. They're given a question and they'll go on and on and on and sometimes incriminate themselves you know which i think whoa whoa whoa, whoa you know please stop mm. now uh, i mean it it's not they they ask very very leading questions you know um how many units are you drink in a week you know this um, is what calf oh, is it? i mean i it's uh, you know um have you ever smoked weed and and and, and things you know and I mean, I would say, is, is, is this relevant? You know, what, what, where, where are we going? Uh, I think some of our service users need training before they have their first meeting or certainly mm. need advocacy, you know, before that, you know, that first meeting. Are these um, professional social workers we're talking about? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. And are these exchanges recorded in any way? Oh, that's a, that's a huge topic. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely furious because I've, I've attended so many and the first thing they say is, are you recording this, this, this meeting? Mm. We, um, they certainly frown upon any form of recording. There is no transparency, there is no accountability because I've sat in a, in a, in a meeting and listened to it all and then I've seen the report and the report is nothing like what, what was said in, 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 in the meeting. Uh, I mean, some of the reports I find extremely, the language they use is extremely offensive. I mean, I can give you an example of that. Uh, one of our service users that I've been very close to, I've, I've worked with a long time then, 
uh, had supervised contact with his four-year-old daughter and it was um, he had a, she had a packet of um, quavers these soft crisps and she dropped one on the floor in in um, in in the, in the room and he said to her, oh that's dirty but before he could get to her she picked it up and she ate it and in the report it was he he allowed her to eat off the floor like a dog and that I complained about the offensive language and um, it, it, it's just continued and it's lifted from one report to another it's, mm. it's not taken out I said do you realize how dogs eat off the floor they, they, you know they don't pick it up with their fingers you know this is not but it's still left in the report mm. and I mean I, I it no wonder there's no trust there between the service user and, and the social worker mm. Uh, when they use language like that for something which is very, very normal and natural for a four-year-old child to mm, do. Yeah, yeah. And even though Dad said it was dirty, he couldn't get there. He couldn't mm, quite yeah. get there in time. Are these interviews conducted with just one parent or with both parents present? Oh, just one parent. Just one, yeah. Mm, uh, th th this was a supervised contact that I'm mm, talking about mm. there. But it's, it's, it, the parents are separate when Kafka's come out. Mm. So they nearly well I, I believe always interview the resident parent first mm. and then they come to the non-resident parent have you ever been present at an interview of the resident parent no 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 so we don't know how that one goes no and and um, how long have you been involved in in these issues how long does your contact with the charity go back it's about 11 years now um my contact with the charity but um, it was very much attend initially it was very much attending meetings and uh, the emotional support things started even though I was emotionally supporting a lot of the service mm. users we didn't have a title for it it mm. is just evolved mm. um, to that um, to that position but it was me maybe getting a venue and you know the, the Cardiff meeting um, mm the venue I've organized and and you know making sure we got tea and coffee and, and and making sure we run in the solicitor as it should as it should be run so did it start off with just Cardiff because it's all over Wales now isn't it? no it um it was just Cardiff Cardiff and Bridgend I've been involved with for you know for quite some time um but uh, I think there's 11 or 12 isn't there over mm. all over Wales yeah yeah when lockdown ends anyway yeah 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 okay and so that that goes back 11 years contact with the charity but what prompted you to get involved with with that sort of work in the first place even going back to 11 years i had an interest first of all around issues with um, male victims of domestic abuse because of the my union work and realizing that there wasn't support for uh, victims of domestic abuse what what was your union work with? i don't think we've mentioned that um i was a, an equalities officer for a, a trade union i was an, an elected um equalities officer for for a trade union in in the health sector right. so it was um, basically representing um people on disciplinaries grievances sickness and my biggest role was representing women on work-life balance issues uh, because most women choose to work part-time and most men work full-time mm. um, but it's um, that's, you know something I'd done but I represented some very complex cases on equality equality issues you know mm. Um, mm. around that time um, and, and, did, and did that lead you to any in the context of of work uh, what, what sort of work area was it was the union involved hospitals. with hospitals, hospitals yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. so did you were there any sort of gender issues there or um well yeah um every every four years the health board has to come up with their equality objectives mm. And a few years back, they came up with um, the gender pay gap was one of the, the four equality objectives. Mm. Now, this is this is relevant to the health service. Um, so when I um, questioned the employed equalities officer on this, I said, how have we got the, you know, the gender pay gap on, on here? And he said, well, it's um, well, we did a staff survey. And I said, yeah. And what was the question? Do you think the gender pay gap's important? 
Well, of course, everybody thinks the gender pay gap's important. So they, you know, they tick the box. So mm. because they had so many ticks, mm. they, so, I mean, if you ask the question the right way, you're going to get mm. the answer you want, aren't yes, you? Absolutely. I mean, we've had um, a, a, a gender for change is the, the, the pay system that we, uh, that's been in force for many years now in, in, in the health service. And, you know, if you're a band five, whether you're male or female, you are, it's, is pro rata you get exactly the same money mm. and of course women are overrepresented in every area um i think there's a bit of a debate about consultants but but every other area and even now in cardiff the board is predominantly male mm. um so female you mean female sorry uh, yeah. female yeah um yeah so it's um you know th they're overrepresented, and yet they 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 are saying, and and women make these choices, and they are supported to make these choices, mm, yeah. but yet they say it's a gender pay gap. You know, it's, yeah. uh, what what era are we talking about now? When they first started talking about the gender pay gap, is this when you were still involved in the with the union? This, oh, this no, this last time, this was about four years ago. Yeah. Um, mm. four years ago, but because of the other. Um, organizations I'm involved with and I think I've mentioned diverse Cymru this is where the um, people um, with protected characteristics then can get their voices heard mm. and I fit the category because I'm a woman mm. and because of my age so I, I, I you know I, I get in there mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's, it's good it's a good um, uh, because they get speakers that you're allowed to question and yeah. and one of them w was the equalities officer from from the health board so this is diversity wales is diverse it? cymru is diverse called cymru. It. diverse cymru yeah. so, so perhaps we just go uh, we've we've deviated from where we were but i'll come back to that perhaps we just go off into your other charity involvements and not just charities but the other sort of bodies like mm -hmm. diverse cymru that you're involved with can you give us a a quick summary of those interests. Yeah, um, Action in Cairo Neely, ACE. Um, this, uh, I'm a trustee there as well. Um, and what's their work? The um, health and wellbeing, community cohesion. Um, they, they've done a wonderful work during, during the lockdown. I mm. mean, they've been very supportive of people that have been isolating. Mm. Uh, they do, they, they try, they run courses and they try and get people into employment mm -hmm. um, they got advice um, on benefits um, utilities um, it's it, it's a wonderful organization i'm proud to be part of it it's um, it, it really is pulling the community working well with the community consulting the community and really sort of you know pulling them together Mm. And um, so that's, that's very local, I know. It's, it's just it. this area in, in Cairo. Yeah, Cairo and Ely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, um, we're fortunate enough to be able to use their building for our both parents matter meetings as well. Right. So um, that's um, ACE. Um, I'm a co-opted member of the community um, community health council which um, my interests have been in health for a, um, a long time so we pay visits we are the patient's voice really um, pay visits to surgeries dentists anything to do with the nhs mm. um, get people's opinions on um, what the service was like what you know what their treatment was like mm. were they happy with everything so we collect data feedback mm. uh, we consulted on um, new services that that could um could be you know started and um yeah it's again that, that's a very good opportunity to to get your voice heard um because i keep saying you know what about funding for men what about you know i've i've do you, do you see gender issues in that context yeah uh health health wise yeah i mean we know that um you know, more men die of prostate cancer than women of breast cancer, yet the funding is way tipped over to, mm. you know, towards towards women. Mm. You know, it's... Um, and you're also yeah. involved in something called elder abuse, aren't you? Yeah, I sit on the elder abuse forum, and this again is an opportunity. The first time I, uh, I sat around the table, 
I hardly heard men mentioned at all. It was all about the victimhood of women and what Women's Aid have run campaign after campaign on um, elderly women and how they they have difficulty accessing services but we, we don't hear anything about men but now we do uh, it's changing and it's um, and it, it, it in, the, in the last meeting it was very good to to have a lady that I was looking at her video last night Sally yes she yes. was she, she this asked, is Sally Ann Burris that's yeah. right yeah um, she she attended this forum as well, mm -hmm. so I actually had someone else who was speaking on you know what what, what about men? Mm -hmm. Where do they go if if they disclose that their victims are domestic are older men? They're not believed. So wh wh where do they go? You know how can they ring the you know the helpline when everything on the helpline is is, is regarding women? Mm -hmm. It's not welcoming to men. You know they they they're not they're not trusting the the service that they uh, that they seeing um, so it's um, and, and with the elder abuse forum it's it's um, with with a few of the forums it's given me access to the older persons commissioner so it's um, it's again um, an an open door for me then so have you got any first hand experience of elderly men that are yes. subject to abuse yeah I'm actually looking out for two of them at the moment. Um, one of them is a service user of Both Parents Matter. And the other one I got to know via a friend who was being abused by his daughter, who was actually been sofa surfing for over a year, 78, he's got health problems. And um, really, we've now got him settled in a flat and things are really changing for him. And he's absolutely overwhelmed you know and mm. by your situation at the moment um, but this it's yeah I, I see it I see it quite a lot mm. I mean because we, we talk about domestic abuse um, we think about domestic abuse then as just being partner abuse but it's not yeah. you know it's it's any member of the family can mm. be abusive you mm. know it can be your son your daughter it can be you your grandmother it can be you know it can be any member of mm. the family mm. but we've just focused on partner abuse mm. yeah well it's distressing that elderly people are subject to the same uh, problems and the same discrimination as, as younger people Absolutely. perhaps we can come back to um, how you got involved I mean we we detoured on to your history of being a equalities officer in yeah. the Union so you've clearly had uh, a professional interest in equalities for a long time um, but how did you get involved, and, and medical issues as well goes back a yeah. long time, but how did you get involved or how did your interest start specifically in men and boys and specifically in issues about parental separation? I think that was when my son and his wife split up. Um, it was, um, yeah, that, it's very personal. It's. Um, they were married for 15 years, three children, and um, I just couldn't believe the, you know, the outcome there. Um, it, I, I couldn't believe how quickly alienation could happen. I mean, we, they used to stay here all the time. I was the These your grandchildren. My grandchildren, yeah. Um, they, um, I would look after them for mum and dad to work they'd holiday with us they never asked to go home they were absolutely really really happy three three children these three three uh, children yeah um they split up uh, there, there was a, there was a bit of discussion first of all she came my, my son came and and then they decided that they'd try again and it didn't work and you know, I kept saying to them, now whatever happens, whatever you decide, the children must come first. These children must know that they're loved by everyone. And I mean, I really spent some time trying to enforce this. You know, children, they must know that they're loved and, and cared for by everyone. And um, within, there was a bit of a kickback from, from the children initially um, mm. within the first couple of weeks. No, we want to see dad. We want to see, you know, we want to. Um, but after I would say maybe even a month there was a complete change of character in those children 
they were well they were they were loving caring um respectful um i was so proud of them beautiful children that i was very very proud of and then they became they hated they were abusive but they were rewarded for being abusive i mean they stopped using they didn't call me nan anymore they called mm. me my first name if if there was ever a conversation if mm. ever i it, maybe that would be the phone mm. and they could they were calling my son by his first name mm. uh, and that happened within weeks and, and i mean really sort of it it was it, it was just unbelievable that children could change that quickly and i and i i do know it's you know they have to protect themselves they mm. they they have to you know think i've well i've got to live with this so i've got i've got to i've got to be compliant um had you come across alienation before yeah. this yeah you didn't know what it was at that time no no not not, not at all i mean i was divorced i had three children um but my children were older when you know when we separated but um uh my children continued seeing their dad and mm. and you know and which i'm very grateful for because we got mutual grandchildren mm. and there isn't an issue if we ever mm. um if if we ever meet up for birthdays or anything like that it, it's it's not it's not a problem mm. um but no i've never witnessed it before and I mean, it, it's not just us, it's the whole of the paternal family don't see those children mm. and some of the maternal family. His sister um, doesn't see the children mm. because his sister have said, what you're doing to these children is harming them. They need their father in their lives. They need, you know. Mm. How long ago was this? This is 11, about 11 years now. So how old are the, the children now? Uh, they're 22, 20 and 16 now. Okay, yeah. so there's one still well, a child. And do you, yeah. do you have any relationship with them now? No. Um, we, um, no, it, it, it got to a stage where I was told that they would, wouldn't accept presents from me anymore. They certainly wouldn't see me. They wouldn't accept presents. They would accept money. And um, then I was sending cards and I was told by my eldest granddaughter that if I continued telling her how much in these cards, how much I loved and missed them, that she was going to seek legal advice for harassment. So that, um, yeah, so that, that's how bad it gets. I mean, it, it's just, I mean, this is when I, I started. I mean, I got very, very low. It was just because they were a massive part of my life, of our lives. And I got very low. And because I was quite active within the community, I rung quite a few different people uh kafkas included you know what what can i do i'm just prevented from seeing my mm. grandchildren they weren't a lot of help so eventually i um i spoke to both parents matter and it was a local counselor mm. guided me you know t to them mm. and that's what i've been ever since and i'm really glad that i found them because i think with me um helping other people in the way that I do in, in, in with emotional support um, helps me as well because it, it, it is a grieving process you never mm. forget it it's uh, I mean as a grandmother it's a bit of a double whammy I was very very concerned about my son's welfare mm. um, he was grieving for his children it was it was and, and had no control they, uh, the courts take absolute control it, it's, it's just awful I mean, he's an advanced, he's a healthcare professional. Um, no, you know, no safeguarding issues at all. And he was told that he could only have indirect contact with his youngest child. That that and, and indirect contact means he can write to her. Yeah. And of course, he would never know whether she got the letter. And did that ever change, or did it remain? Um. Well? It's it's remained much the same there's been a couple of episodes of where she's asked or contact him she was poorly at one time and wanted to see her dad and um and he did and then she asked could she she meet him um at at school and there was someone there from the pastoral team at the, at the, at the school to mm. to supervise 
And this is only one of the children. This, this is the youngest the one. Youngest one the yeah. youngest one, yeah. Um, but the eldest one uh, is at a work placement in the area that my son works. And whilst she had the work placement, was absolutely fine and dad and, you know, um, polite. Mm. And, mm. and as soon as she finished it, she was back to the way, the way mm. she was. Mm. Do you see your experience reflected in the service users? Absolutely, as absolutely, mm. especially grandparents, because, mm. you know, um, grandmothers, and it's usually grandmothers. We mm. do get a couple of granddads, but it's, it's mostly grandmothers come. And, um, yeah, uh, my experience, and, and the experience of my son, I see, you know, in, reflected regularly. Um, mm. I mean, when I think it can't get any worse, it does. I've always got tissues at the ready in all, all the mm-hmm. meetings I go to, you know, mm. because it, you know, we, it, it's, it's terrible. Uh, I mean, men are so vulnerable these days to malicious allegations. Mm. And of course, it, it only needs an allegation. I mean, the Me Too movement has just moved it on that massive stage further mm. that it, you know, it's, if it's a sexual allegation, my God, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's just so worrying and, you know, I mean, I've got sons, I've got grandsons, that I'm just very, very concerned about the way the world is going, that, you know, um, that men are really, well, they're not in with a chance. I mean, they, if an allegation is made, they have to prove their innocence. It's mm. not, you know, it's... Yeah. it's what awful. proportion of service users of BPM? are um, subject to allegations, do you think? Most of them, I'd say. Mm. Um, most of them, because, of course, is a gateway to legal aid mm. for women. Domestic abuse is a, is a gateway to legal aid. Mm. And do you want I, to expand on that a little for, yeah. for people? Yeah, so it's if they're a victim of domestic abuse, you know, they're um, more, much more likely, and, and it's uh, evidence then, and women's aid can evidence, you know, that they're a victim. So all they've got to do is go to women's aid and say, yeah, he's at me, you know. Well, that's you know, no investigation. Well, family courts are based on probability anyway. You know, it's, it's not fact. It's not, you know, mm. it's, it's all based on probability. So it's, um, yeah, they, they can go to, they, they can go to their GP. Um, they can go to a nurse. They can go, they can go to, um, as I said, Women's Aid or, or any of the many sister charities Women's Aid have, mm. have, have got and get that evidence letter. Yeah, this is the, the so-called uh, domestic violence evidence gateway, isn't That's it? That's right, but yeah. Because the uh, legal aid was withdrawn from civil cases in uh, 2013, mm. but this, this gateway, if you allege domestic violence. Yeah, so, and, um, and, and it's just alleged, you know, and, yeah. and, and, that, and that's it. I mean, I don't think there are any winners in family court, and certainly children are not. You know, it, it's mm. it's just um, it really lets children down badly. You know, I mean, it's, it, mm. the, the system is really, really failing. But the um, primary legal duty of the family courts is to put the best interest of the child first and make their interest paramount. Yeah, I mean, even their um, their wishes and feelings reports. I mean, it's you know, I've re- I've read them and it got my God, it's upset me so much to read those wishes and feelings reports because mm. those children are using words that they would never normally mm. use. It's been written for them, mm. basically. They've been really guided through it, and and it's it's. Um, you know, is it is it their wishes and feelings? No, it's not their wishes and feelings. You know, and I mean, um, it 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 it's just as I said, the system is failing, failing badly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you you mentioned um, sitting in on meetings with Kafkas. Can we just return briefly to? statutory services then generally and and what role they play in this whole process well kafkas i i've sat in with social workers as well i've sat i've, I've gone to um lack meetings which is looked after child meetings so it means the, the child is in foster care or, or or whatever and again those meetings are you know i mean it's um they, they're not helpful. Um, they is it, is always challenging the non-resident parent. They they should be there 
the LAC meetings are to to get the um, the non-resident parent up to speed with the development of the child, with you know what's happening, where they are education-wise and and and, and health-wise and and all that. And and the ones that I've sat in are are not not like that at all. It's um, I mean I've got one service user that's got a, a looked after child and it was last january that he had any contact at all how did he end up being looked after i mean the the, the this usual scenario is there's a resident parent and a non-resident parent and yet but how did he go from that to being a looked after right. child? right well the this particular um service user um his the mother of his child was mentally ill and seriously mentally ill and as the history of mental Ill illness during pre and postnatally then mm. and she assaulted him which is in in the court records I've, I've seen it and he tried to pull away and she fell back and cut her head so he end up, ended up being deemed the perpetrator of domestic abuse she was um, extremely vulnerable because of a, a mental health condition and uh, they ended up then um, taking the child into care. Is was being the child cared. placed with the mother initially in that case? Yeah, the, the child was with the mother. The father was made to uh, move out and he was the main support for the mother. Um, in Wales, we have... we. We haven't got a mother and baby unit in Wales, which is absolutely shocking, because one in five women suffer mental health problems in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And 2013, they closed the mother and baby mm -hmm. unit, and it, we haven't had one open since. There's plans. There's plans at the moment, there's isn't there? Plans yeah. We'll not moment. go there. That'll no. be a whole different interview. Exactly. <coughs> there's plans at the moment, but again, it's... Um, uh, it's worrying. So, I mean, the, the uh, previous pregnancy, she was in a mother and baby unit, mm. kept the child and, and mm. recovered and, and became okay. And because the facility wasn't there, they removed the child. And So the child, have I got this right then, this scenario, this particular case, they removed from a mother who was struggling for various mm. mental health reasons, they removed from her her actual real support, which yes. was her partner. Yeah. Um, and having removed the partner so that she could no longer cope, they then put the child in care. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> Words fail mother, me. mother and father now have contact, supervised contact. It should have been every three months, I think, mm. but because of COVID, it's not. Mm. It's not. Is this happened. a rare scenario? You think? I don't think so. I mean, I've I've witnessed a child being taken, and I'm still reeling from it. I witnessed a child being taken ten o'clock at night, taken four hours away in a car with two social workers, the grandmother screaming. The the father the day before had, had a um, a safeguarding check by local authorities, and he was fine. Um, but the court in Surrey had made a decision to take this child. The child was taken by two social workers, 10 o'clock at night. The child had to be woken up. And as, as they were leaving, the grandmother said, um, oh, don't forget her medicine. Those two social workers were taking that child mm. four hours away in a car and didn't know whether she had a medical condition or not. Shocking. And I'm still reeling from that. I mean, it, it's... Um, I, I said, can't you wait? Can't you wait somewhere till the morning? Can't we, you know? I, I said, you, you know, you don't know if she's diabetic, mm. epileptic. You don't, you, you don't know anything about about mm. this child. Mm. You no, know, court has said, and this is what we do, and that's how cruel the system is. Mm. Well, I know the number of children being taken into care yes. in England yeah. and Wales is soaring. It's yeah. more in Wales, isn't it? Is it? Uh, 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 I think both, both the whole of the UK really, really? is increasing. Right. So. You've been involved in these things for quite a while. Do you think they're getting better or worse? It, that, that's really difficult to say because, of course, I'm seeing the the worst of it mm. beca because of the nature of what we do. Mm. And family court's a secret, and mm. so we don't know the outcomes. We don't know if there are, if there are good outcomes. I, I doubt it. You know, it's... Mm. Um, 
you know, get into family court is, you know, there's, there's a lot of conflict before you, you get there. And, and one person's rewarded with the children by the sound most of the time. Mm. And, and, and of course, child arrangements orders are not enforced or very rarely enforced. Yeah. So even if you've got a child arrangements order, it's, is it worth the paper it's written on? You know? Do you think the ordinary man and woman in the street that haven't themselves been through separation are aware of these issues? No, I don't. I, I really don't because um, um, I had no idea until it, my mm. son. Mm. No idea. And, and I, I can, you know, when we talk about parental alienation, it, it's, um, you, you explain it to people and oh, uh, somebody always knows someone that's been through it, mm. you know, when you, you talk it through. Mm. Um, oh, yeah, my, you know, my, my cousin went through that, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it, I, I, I think it's, is it getting worse? I think it's happening more often because more couples are splitting up. You know, mm. it, you know, divorce rates, are, you know, are, mm. so I, I, it's not improving. And I think the system is deteriorating, it's overloaded, it's not, you know, it's... Um, what would you say to people who argue that there's no such thing as parental alienation and it's actually just a ruse used by abusive fathers oh, to detract, uh, you know, deflect attention from their own abusive behaviour. There's a lot I'd like to say, but I can't <laughs> say. Um, but um, this, you know, I, I mean, I've I've seen this, you know, coming from Women's Aid, and um, and sister organisations, you know, and it's but. What about people like me? What what about the the mothers that is that that it's happening to? Mm. It's not it's not anything to do with gender. Mm. It's a behaviour. Mm. It's a behaviour that you know people people use and weaponise their children and, and harm their children. I mean, if you look at the adverse childhood experiences, you know th th this is way up there on the scale. Mm. Mm. You know about you know both parents not being involved in in, in their lives and. Mm. I mean, I'm messing with their minds, as I say, when they talked, when they taught to love and respect, and then rewarded for the absolute opposite. It's, it, it must be that their poor little minds must be just. Do you think it has a long-term effect oh, on them? Oh, it definitely as does. It definitely yeah. does. I I know, um, you know personally, it, it, it definitely does. Mm. You know, it's. Um, well, we've been talking for quite a while, but there's one other topic that we haven't addressed, um, which you might like to tell us something about. That's in 2017, with the assistance of your then assembly member, you made a complaint to the EHRC, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. I did. Can you tell us something about that? Right. Um, first of all, my, my AM is the First Minister, is Mark Drakeford. Although he wasn't at that time, was he? Uh, no. Oh, was he? No. I uh, think it was just before, yeah. Right, oh, he was um, finance then, it was, yeah. So, yeah, I went, um, I went along and um, it's because I was supporting a service user uh, one day and he was very traumatised by what had happened to him and I rang the Live Fear Free helpline and um, the lady that answered the phone to me, I said, oh, first of all, um, I'm ringing on behalf of a man. He's with me now, but he's very traumatized and he wants me, you know, he, he'd like, like some advice. And she said, oh, a man? I said, yes. I said, you do support men. Oh, just a minute, she said. <laughs> this, I, is, this is the... Um, live fear, live fear, fear, free. fear Free. Don't they, don't they, um, aren't they behind the Dean Project? Well, Safer Wales. Um, yeah, Safer yeah, Wales, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so this is Women's Aid, I think, is, right. is Le Fia Free. Right, right, sorry, yes, so I'm getting the said, two confused. <laughs> so she said, um, oh, just a minute, I need to go and check with my line manager. So she comes back and she said, yeah, we actually do support men. I said, <laughs> great, okay. So I said, can you tell me then, do you send them to the Dean Project? Where, where do you send Oh, just a minute, I need to speak to my line manager. So off she trots again. So she comes back. Um, my line manager said the man needs to speak for himself, she said. And I said, what? I said, he, he, he's, he's, he's extremely emotional. And I said, so you can't, you can't help by speaking to me? No. 
So I went to a conference and I related, relayed this. I was sat in the front, ready to, you know, ready to get a question answered. What conference is it? This was. Uh, this could have been the Elder Abuse Conference, yeah, okay. um, because I said he, um, the chair was very good at pulling me in to, mm. to ask questions. So I, 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 I relayed this in, in, in the, or it, it must have been somebody new on the phones. It must, you know, you know, it, it, it must have been. And um, so it went, yeah, it, it, it went on from there. And I can't, where were we going then? Oh, 2017. So. I, I realised then that men were being supported in, in, in the right way and so went to Mark Drakeford and said, look, I'm very concerned that women are being believed and men men are not. What happens when a man phones the Dean Project? Because the Dean Project is um, the Welsh or at least the Cardiff service for male victims of domestic abuse. At least notionally, it is. It is. Uh, yeah. what, and what happens when a man right, phones well, them? Does he get the same reception? Or, uh, no, he, he, there's a, um, uh, a tick list then. So they, they go through a questionnaire, mm. and you know, if you get so many ticks in in the one column, mm. then you are actually posing as a victim. This is the the so-called respect toolkit for use with Ab male victims. Absolutely. Yes. Mm. So um, you you could you know ring as a victim, but you could end up as the perpetrator because you you know I mean these things are uh, have you ever retaliated? Have you ever raised your voice? Mm. You know things like that. That's could really it possibly <laughs> be turned around to be your fault? <laughs> it, absolutely. Is there any way we can do this? Yeah. Um, but saying that, I have sat in. I've gone to the Dean Project mm. with a service user, mm. and there was a lady there this time who said, "I am supposed to do this." but I'm not going to do it. This man was already deemed high risk, um, at risk anyway. Um, so I went to Mark Drakeford with all this I information and he said, right. He said, uh, I said, this, this is discrimination. I said, you know, I've looked at the, you know, mm. the equalities and human rights po uh, policies and protocols and this is discrimination. And of course, Mark Drakeford would be aware of your background as an equalities. Yeah. Uh, officer yeah. in a union and a long-term Labour, Labour Party member, member. and right. of course he's Labour. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he wrote then to the um, to the commission, and what what they came back with first of all was a gift. I mean, I just absolutely loved it because I, I don't think you've mentioned this before. It um, the, it came back saying it is essential to screen men because of statistical probability. Have you, have you haven't seen that document, I don't have you? think no. I've seen that So one. this was the first one that came back. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a gift. <laughs> this was, I was, I was you know, really over the moon with this. So um, I went back to Mark. I said, since when then has the Equalities and Human Rights you know, uh, started supporting the majority, not the... Exactly. It's not incredible. The it's the incredible, minor isn't it? It's unbelievable. Minority. I mean, it's so, supposed so, to be about supporting so, uh, minorities, ex if anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what's happening here, Mark? Yeah. You've looked at the policies, yeah. and this is what they've put. Yeah. He said, oh, God. And he was, he, he was really taken back. Mm. I said, you know, so... Um, so again, he wrote, and, and this time um, it was that, that I needed a meeting with him, and uh, I was introduced to the head of policy uh, at the time, and sat down with her, and spent um, nearly two hours with her going through, going through all this. Mm. Yeah, but, but, you know, but Anne, you know, it is, you know, they are the... I said, no, victims are victims, you know. It, it, you know, they all feel pain, they all bleed, they all feel shame. Mm. So, you know, tell it... So, um, right, okay, um, right, I've, I, I've noted down what you said and I'll take this back to the legal department. So it goes back and it was months and I'm on the case all the time because mm. I'm a bit like that. I don't let things go. So I kept bringing, where are we, where are we, mm. you know, what, what, what's the response? So eventually, um, I think Mark wrote again um, because I said, look, I'm not getting anything from them. Yeah. So I think he prompted them again. Yeah. So it was, um, they came back with then, this is far too complex for our legal department to deal with. So we are going to commission um, a barrister, um, a, a, an expert barrister on human rights. So they did, but they wouldn't let me present my case. They, they, I didn't know who the barrister was. 
Um, I didn't know what case that they were going to present, what they what they were going to offer to him or mm. her, to, you know, to, to look at. So I went back to Mark Drakeford again. Mm. I said, this is ridiculous. I can't present a case when I don't know what they're presenting. So he wrote to them again, and I was allowed to see what they were presenting. Mm. So uh, in the end, the barrister came back and said, yes, it is direct discrimination. Mm. You know, it, it, it is. Mm. But then nothing's changed because they've then sort of said that, um, because of course I was very aware because I sit on lots and lots of different groups and I said, oh, but that is direct discrimination now to do that, you know. And they then they came back and said if it was a single sex service, it was okay to not to believe men really. Yeah. So the, you yeah. can't, any given service, if it, if it addresses both male and female victims, does, according to that ruling, have to treat them equally. Equally. Or, otherwise they'd be risking you know, a case against them under the Equalities Act 2010. But you can wriggle out of that if you're a single yeah. sex service provider. And two different service providers, one providing services to men, one providing services to women need not deploy the same process. So yeah. the Dean Project, only dealing with men, can deploy the toolkit yeah. for use with male victims, yeah. i.e. 17 questions yeah. asking, are you really the perpetrator? Uh, but women's aid and other women's services can just be leave the victim. Yeah. And that is deemed at the present time to be legal. Absolutely. And it's, yeah. it's, it's shocking. And I'm still looking at another angle to attack it from, but uh, I haven't come up with anything just yet because because I'm sure it is still discrimination yeah. because victims are victims, you know. I mean, it's uh, yeah. yeah. And we've been uh, going quite a long time, so I think we better bring it to an end. But it's uh, been a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm sure the the viewers will find what you have to say very enlightening and um, harrowing. But enlightening. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I would like to say just one yeah, one means, more yeah. thing is that um, I've had no formal training really. I mean I've done a little bit of equalities work with, with Unison. Um, but my my first meeting was with the then first minister politically mm. that um, was Rodri Morgan and it was over somebody that had been trafficked here to um, and left um, in the sticks and he, he eventually broke into a house because he was hungry he, so I, I i thought my god this man is a victim he's not he, so he was in prison nobody could understand he, he was uh, moroccan and he spoke berber and nobody could understand what he was speaking so i was on the case there so i went to Rodri morgan and uh, i sat down with him and sort of talked him through it and he said Right, what, what, what do you want me to do? I said, well, I was hoping that you, you would come up with something here, you know. <laughs> so he did. He wrote to the, mm. to, um, to the Refugee Council mm. and, and, and all this and, and done some work. And from then on, I've had no issues going to see any member, MP, AM, whatever. They're there to work for you. Mm. And and they're there to to write for you, you know, to write on behalf of you as your as your constituent. Mm. Make them work for you. Mm. I mean, it's you know, if if I can get the Equalities and Human Rights Commission to to step down on 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 an issue, anybody mm. can. Mm. Anybody can do that. Mm. Especially women, it's so much easier for women to mm. to to fight men men and boys issues. And it, it would be good to see. A lot more women in, involved mm. in I this. I think we're beginning to see just that. I mean, you I mentioned think so. Sally Ann Burris. Yeah. And there's yeah. there's many others. So. I think so. Thank you. Thank again you. Again for your time. That's a good note on which to end. I think. Thank you.